raise, you know, um, capital, and then, you know, is that a transaction-based compensation for that person, or is that something different? So we actually do not use licensed brokers. So the, the SEC requires that if you have a person that is selling another group or individual securities, they have to be licensed brokers. And uh, this, this has actually turned into a little bit of a scandal here recently within the real estate syndication world because you, you did have people that were out there and advertising deals that they were not part of. Uh, and they were receiving compensation based on it. Uh, and so, no, our group and I think multifamily in general does not do any sort of advertising of deals that we are not directly involved in. So anybody who is part of a deal here is also part of the general partnership. And it's instead of selling another person's securities, the SEC allows you to be unlicensed if you are, um, you know, you are promoting your own securities. Got it. So that person, you know, has some share responsibilities in addition to raising capital. So it, it, as a part of the deal, as opposed to just a fee for doing his Absolutely. or her job. Absolutely. You, you, you sound like you're knowledgeable on this topic. So the, the SEC uh, requires that they have a substantive and ongoing, this is their terminology, substantive and ongoing relationship uh, with the investment. And so what that means is, is that they can't just be raising capital until the close of the sale, but they actually need to be part of the team that manages the the usually it's a three to five year hold and the improvements the capital improvements that go into the property and then finally the the disposition of the sale which is the sale at the end of three to five years where um, or a refinance event where the investors are returned to their capital and they maintain their ownership within the building so you you have to be a part of the team throughout the entire life cycle of the investment according to the SEC. Got it. Thank you. Was there another question? Okay. So why do I like real estate investment as opposed to single family homes or short term rentals or private investment mortgages or, or REITs? And the main reason is, is that, um, you can combine your assets together with a group of people in order to purchase an institutional class property or a larger property. So I like the, the teamwork and camaraderie of getting together with people that are knowledgeable and people that are executing on a business plan. Um, I like the fact that assets in the real estate market have three to five year cash flow projections. Um, and so if you look at our underwriting, I've got I'll show some of the underwriting during our, our next meeting. But the, the underwriting will go through and make reasonable assumptions about what rent growth and expense growth will be, what taxation rates will be, and you can get a three to five year or seven year projection of what your, um, what your investment is going to be. And I personally like that quite a bit to the unpredictability of other classes of investments. Um, the investors get to share in the cash flow of the asset during the lifetime of the asset. So after the close of the apartment building, investors participate in the cash flow that comes in from monthly rents. And uh, that continues all the way until the asset is sold. So there's an ongoing cash flow. There is the potential of any gains. So in the sale or in the refinance of the property, so the, the syndicator or the general partnership is responsible for increasing the value of the property by doing renovations or, or other types of improvements. And over the three to five year hold of that, the property, um, uh, if things go according to the business plan, increases in value and the investors get to share in the realization of that equity increase. So you have the, the cash flow, you have the equity increase. Um, I like real estate syndication because oftentimes you can get into a syndication for uh, a minimum investment of around $25,000, $50,000, $75,000. It depends on 
uh, the particular people that are setting up the syndication, but oftentimes it can be lower than the down payment on a house. So you can get into it at lower price points than other types of real estate investments. You have direct ownership of the asset. So unlike, unlike a REIT or a fund where you are putting money into the fund and then it's acquiring assets according to certain criteria, uh, in the real estate syndication model, all of the partners are owners in the asset. They, they hold units of the LLC, which owns the asset. Uh, it allows you to scale at, to, to invest at scale and have a greater predictability of revenue. I already, I already mentioned that. Uh, comes with a business plan and forward-looking projections, performs sensitivity analysis. So sensitivity analysis, ever since 2008, investors are extremely sensitive to downturns in the market, at least a lot of good ones are. It's, it's, uh, uh, people do a lot of analysis in, of what's called sensitivity analysis. And that is basically, you know, if the market took a 30% downturn, what would be the outcome that would be uh, projected through my five-year forecast or my seven-year forecast? So look for, look for people that are doing sensitivity analysis that could say, what happened if, you know, revenue stayed flat? What happened if it went up 30%? What happens if it goes down 30%? Um, sensitivity analysis is a good thing to ask people for when you're getting into these types of investments. Uh, the investments insured. So there's, uh, I, I, simply like the fact that it's insured and if the worst case scenario happened you know a stock or other thing other types of securities can go to zero it's very unlikely that the value of a building is going to go to zero so it's an insured asset and it's it's um, it's intrinsically worth something because it's a physical asset it provides great tax benefits so there's depreciation when investors get their uh, returns which are on K-1 forms, partnership forms usually, um, there is a depreciation, a negative income that's passed through that people can use to deduct from their taxes. So you can, you can talk to your CPA about depreciation, and most people know from rent single-family rental homes what depreciation is. So you, you take the value of the asset, you divide it up over 27 and a half years, and you're allowed to depreciate a certain amount of that every year. Now with the with a apartment complex, uh, first of all, it's depreciated over 39 years, but you can do what's called a cost segregation study. And the cost segregation study is when a, uh, a CPA comes in and says, hey, the, the life of this roof is not 39 years, it's seven years. And so we're going to accelerate the depreciation over a seven year timeline. And the, the light switches are only going to last 15 years, and the light bulbs might last five years. And so they have actuarial tables that go through in incredible detail and break down everything from the faucets, the toilets, the copper wiring in the walls, and they give each of them their own depreciation schedules. What this lets you do is it, it, it greatly allows you to uh, accelerate the amount of depreciation that you take towards the uh, upfront time in the investment. So in your first couple of years, you'll be able to deduct quite a bit of uh, depreciation from your taxes. And um, and I love meeting people. Um, so the, the podcast is wonderful because I can meet people continuously. Uh, I get to know people that are in the business and are operating within the business. And I've formed some very good partnerships that way. So how do you buy an apartment complex that is thousands of miles away? It's all about the team. So here are some of the people that uh, my business has partnered with in the past. So Josh Welch was from Three Pillars Capital Group. He was the main investor there. They owned their own property management company in-house as well as their own brokerage in-house. And so they were able to provide really great efficiencies in their business model because those things were, were in-house and they didn't contract them out to third parties who took fees. Uh, Donna Kay is, has been in property management for 30 years. She's currently a partner at Alon Capital. And Jessica Lowing has been in project management for quite a while. She, she actually is a, she's a math uh, graduate from MIT, uh, but now she does project management. Patrick Duffy is, uh, 
he is a graduate. He's actually a Harvard graduate, but he's been in acquisitions and asset management now for 10 years, I believe. But anyway, he's he's the owner of Tactical Asset Management, who is uh, responsible for a lot of the renovations that we do within our group. And then Mark Kenny is the founder of Think Multifamily and is very no, well known within the industry. Um, saying that you're involved with Mark Kenny has been a great way to, to open doors and to meet people. Uh, and he's usually the um, lead in a lot of the projects that we do. So a, a syndication is divided up into general partners who find the deal, they structure the financing, they create the legal entities, they do all the upfront risk capital. So uh, before you know if you're going to buy an apartment building, you have to put together the legal framework, which costs money. It usually costs around $20,000 to create a, a syndication structure. And uh, you have to do the due diligence work, which involves, you know, hiring inspectors that inspect the electrical, the plumbing, the roof. Uh, these are all fees that even if you don't buy the property, you're not going to get back. So it's called at-risk capital. And uh, so the, the partners have to put, to put, put up the at-risk capital. They pay lenders fees, they perform due diligence, they pay inspection fees, etc. They also go through and manage the, the asset for its entire lifetime. The passive investors uh, are responsible for providing the equity investment. Uh, they do not have control over the business plan, but rather beforehand they should read over the business plan that's disclosed to them and make sure that they, they it's something that they're willing to invest in. And the one of the big key differences is, is the general partners have an unlimited amount of liability, meaning that they are liable for the entire uh, value of the building or the loan on the building. And the limited partners are only liable for the amount which they invest. So if you have a $50,000 investment in it, you're only, uh, the maximum amount you can lose would be $50,000. And the way this is usually structured, and so here's here's the diagram of the LLCs. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna this is one of our investor decks that we'll go through next week. So the the ownership structure is often like this: you have one holding company for the limited partners, and this this LLC here actually owns the asset, and then one company for the management which manages the holding company that owns the asset. And the way that the funds are distributed is that investors receive a preferred return on the money that's paid to them. So when you're looking at a syndication, the return will often say, you know, we offer a 6% or a 7% or an 8% preferred return. And what that means is that when rents come in and when you start to receive a return on your investment, the investors or the limited partners receive the 8% preferred return or whatever the preferred return happens to be before the general partners receive anything. And what that does is that motivates the general partners to make sure that the property performs at at least 8%, you know, and hopefully up to whatever their target projections were, if that's, you know, maybe they had a 10% target projection. Um, so if they, they don't get compensated anything unless they meet their preferred return, and then above their preferred return, there is a equity split. So a lot of syndications do a 20-80 equity split or a 30-70 equity split. And what that means is that anything that's, um, any, any money that comes in, 20% or 30%, whatever it is, will go to the general partnership and 70 to 80% will go to the investors. With the first 8% uh, or whatever the preferred return is going to the investors before the general partnership gets anything. So there, that's what the preferred return is. And the back end return is when the sale is sold there is uh, usually a profit that's realized to that point if the market has been going up and that profit is split in the same ratios with the limited partners. And of course, then the depreciation and tax benefits flow through to their 
uh, their income statement. Okay, I already mentioned what an accredited sophisticated investor is. And how do limited partners make money? So they, they make their money from the preferred return, which is paid on a monthly or quarterly basis, uh, plus the profit split, which is uh, at the sale of the asset or the refinance. Any refinances that are in between might return a significant amount of the capital to the limited partners, but they'll retain ownership of the amount that they originally invested in. So if they, if they uh, put in you know, uh, $100,000 and that was enough to own 5% of the building, they retain that 5% ownership, even if, if their money is, is sent back to them through a refinance. So they maintain sh their equity ownership. And again, depreciation. So here are some of the people that play roles in the general partnerships of a syndication. You have uh, people that do broker relations. So the first thing you need to do is identify where a property is going to be and start developing relationships with brokers in that area. And it's a very competitive business, extremely competitive business. So you need to know those brokers on a first name basis. You need to take them out golfing. You need to go to coffee with them. You need to go, you know, see their 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 kids after school play. Um, you need to know them really well, and you need to be the first ones that are on their mind when a good deal comes up so that they will send that deal to you. Then once that deal is sent to you, you do your, your initial due diligence, and you do your underwriting, which determines uh, what you think your, your financial projections will be for this particular investment, and you'll submit a letter of intent to the seller and the letter of intent says that we're it's basically a, a letter which informally says we're interested in buying your property for this price and then there'll be a, a call for uh, letters of intent where the broker will ask the different people that are bidding on the property to submit their their best offer and then there'll be back and forth negotiation with the seller and the seller will sign a purchase and sales agreement with whoever they choose. So that's the prop, that's the process of uh, acquisition. And you, you usually have a full-time person that's involved only in getting to know the brokers and making sure that they have good broker relations. And then there's the property manager. The property manager is usually someone who's paid uh, around 4% of the monthly gross income from the rents in order to manage the properties. Uh, in single-family homes, this number is often around 10%, but uh, it's in larger buildings, that percentage falls, down, falls a little bit, so pretty typical is 4%. Uh, due diligence, CPA, bookkeepers, broker relations are critical uh, because the type of loan that you get on the property can make or break the, the deal for the investors. Uh, there's the relationships with the contractors, the cost segregation specialists, uh, all the people that are investors, the the people on the general partnership that do the investor relations, the property tax consultant, title escrow, syndication attorney, etc. Uh, so I, I included in here, um, and this is just a huge list that we don't have time to go through, but all the responsibilities or many of the responsibilities of the general partnership in finding the property before the contract goes to to uh, close, and then once the contract closes, or once the contract is uh, an LOI is accepted, and the purchase and sales has been accepted, you need to do the due diligence, create investor summaries, announce the deal to potential investors, uh, create an investment webinar or a seminar where you can invite your best investors in to tell them all about the property and what the particular attributes are of the property and create the legal documents, the LLC, and coordinate all the financing to close on the deal. And then, of course, afterwards, you need to bring it through the entire life cycle of adding value to the property, creating a better place for people to live, um, finding out ways of increasing your, your rental income, and providing a return to your investors. So I'm going through this a little bit quicker. 
the value add business model. Um, the thing that makes this a good model and the thing that makes this not dependent on the market as much is that if you buy it properly and you have room to add value to it, that commercial property is valued differently than residential property. Residential property uses the comparison method where you'll look at the, the houses that are around you that are comparables to your house. And if they recently sold at a certain price, then probably your house will sell at that price. Uh, with with commercial real estate and with apartment buildings, it's all based on the income method. So in other words, if your property produces a certain amount of income, then uh, it's worth a multiple of that income. So anything that the owner can do to improve the income of the property also improves the overall value of the property. Uh, and that's how, that's how uh, operators provide in return to their investors. They increase the income of the property, which allows them to appraise their property at a higher value, and then they can refinance or sell it at, at a higher value in return to return uh, the investment to their investors. Okay, so that was a really high overview of what syndication is, how you have general partners and limited partners, how the limited partners provide capital to the, the investment, the general partners apply the business knowledge and execution to the investment. And um, next, next week, we'll go through a specific example, Camino de Sol Apartments, which was 122 units in Houston, Texas. It was a Class C apartment, and it was, the management team here was Three Pillars Capital Group, and my company, Elon Capital, also partnered with them. We're currently going through, we've, we've, we've actually, as of this month, renovated 46% of the units, and we're getting a better than expected rent return on it. So it's, it's executing well, and um, so we'll, we'll go through and do this as a case study next week. I know I talked a lot there, uh, and apologies for anything that was confusing. Are there any questions? Hey, Daniel. Um, uh, in this example, are you partnering as a limited partner, or are you more on the active I'm a, syndicate? I'm a general partner here. Okay. Or rather, my business is a general partner. Hey, how much time commitment does this require? To be a general partner? Yeah. It, it can really depend widely um, because there are, there are different roles. If, for instance, let's say there, there, there a lot of people divide up the equity stack within the general partnership depending on what your role is. So if, say, for instance, you provide risk capital. That could be a very small time commitment. You can just say, hey, yeah, I'll pay the person who's doing the due diligence. And if the property doesn't close, I lost my money. So in that case, you, instead of time, you're, you have risk. So um, on the other hand, if you're responsible for coordinating the property renovations, that's a full-time job. Um, so it can, it can vary quite a bit. I, in my particular case, I'm on the calls each week for the asset management. So I get the reports from the people that are doing the renovations, along with a group of other people there. We Actually, everybody on the general partnership gets those reports. Uh, I also do a lot of the investor outreach, which is what my podcast is, and uh, investor relations. So that's, that's my role in it, and I can do those things at, write articles, communicate with people uh, on off hours. A lot of it is email work. So I do that after work. Um, cool. Thank you. Yeah. And, sorry, will you share the slides? Yeah, I can, I can share the slides. Sure. Uh, I need to, need to, okay. So the, I, I do have an example in here. Uh, the SEC does not allow us to share exact numbers with people that we don't have pre-existing relationships with. So you should just know that these numbers here are a fictitious but typical example. Um, the numbers that we'll be going through next week are for an asset which is no longer available. Uh, and so it is not something that is currently, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a past to deal. And so it's not something that we're currently offering. Uh, if you're interested in getting information about things that we're currently offering, uh, you can contact me.
um, here's my company, Alon Capital. It's at alloncapital.com. And here is our, our business motto is we partner with investors to purchase and operate and, and improve cash flowing properties that have strong investor equity backends. Uh, so if you're interested in that, contact me and I'd love to set up a one-on-one -on -one, you know, uh, call with you. Hey, Daniel, Raul here again. Um, yep. Are you are you guys syndicating specific, like uh, specifically to each deal, or are you guys creating funds to then go and acquire multiple property? It's deal specific. So there's there's a couple of ways you can set it up. Syn syndicating. Uh, usually, when you say syndication, you're talking about a specific deal. And if you're creating a real estate fund, you're creating uh, a fund structure where people pay into it and the fund has acquisition criteria. So the, the, the acquisition is not known ahead of time when the people are putting money into the fund. Uh, so we, we do acquisitions, which means that we find a particular property we do all the underwriting and, do, and most of the due diligence so that we have a good idea of what the business will be. We have the property identified, and then we go to investors. Uh, Daniel, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is the time involved for uh, passive investors, and also what, is, what kind of risks are expected? Sure. So for passive investors, the number one thing that you want to do is you want to get to know the general partnerships and the operators. There's there's quite a few of them out there right now. Actually, I, I really highly recommend this podcast, the Real Estate uh, Syndication Show. It's done by a fellow called Whitney Sewell at LifeBridge Capital. And I have no affiliation. Actually, I, I have invested with him once, so I do have an affiliation. But um, he's... He has a lot of great information on this. In terms of risk, uh, the the main risk is, uh, of course, risk related to the asset itself. So there, there, there is a document that is given to everybody that's involved in syndications that, that goes through and explains all the possible risks. The SEC has this outline, all of it. Um, but it's usually, you know, market risk or management risk or operating risk, um, risk involved in, in uh, managing the property. So from, from a limited investor's point of view, what you really want to do is you really want to find the person who is operating the deal and get to know their track record. Okay, once thanks. once the deal actually closes, um, the limited partners have um, no no tasks to do whatsoever except for most op most general partnerships will have a quarterly investor update call. So you can you can listen in on the update call and just find out how the investor investment's doing. Um, and then once a year they'll send you your tax information that you'll have to incorporate into your tax return. Any other questions? Oh, I see we're over right now. Hey, uh, hey Danny, uh, Daniel. If I want to be a general partner, what is the money required, minimum money required, apart from the time? So it, it depends on the deal. Uh, I've seen deals that start, but most deals start at fifty to seventy-five thousand. Um, I've seen twenty-five thousand dollar deals, but it depends. It depends on the operating, the the general partnership, and what they decide they want to allow as a minimum. Okay. And it's deal specific, so every deal can be different. Was there another question? Okay. So well, thank you so it much. Seems like, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh um, so it seems for the majority of organizations, if not all of them, you are leveraging broker relationships or rather, or, you know, instead of straight to the seller. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The sellers, you know, are usually busy people and brokers are, you know, they're paid to get a better price for their seller. So brokers are usually used. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel.
Okay. Um, you know, my apologies. I started recording this about a third of the way through, so I missed the first third of this. Um, I will post the recording on our site. Thank you so much for everybody coming. Thank you.